Welcome to GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises, the program where we take an intergenerational approach to the book of Revelation. I'm John Pauline. I'm a professor of religion at Loma Linda University. And on the other side, I have Guillerme Borda, who is a doctoral student in New Testament at Andrews University. And in the middle, our beloved colleague who is able to be with us from Norway in the studio. And a Sigva Tonstad, author of many books, including a book, Commentary on the Book of Revelation, uh, that uh, has been very important reading for me. Well, when we closed last time, we were looking at Joel, because the latter part of the book of Revelation 14 uh, makes a lot of allusion to Joel. Let me just share a couple more texts. We read uh, verse 32, which envisions God's people as in Jerusalem, surrounded by armies. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, it's set up on a hill and has walls around it, and it goes down steeply on three sides. So uh, the idea of an army down there in the valley surrounding the city and threatening to attack is, is a very vivid image that people reading this text in Jerusalem would, would be familiar with. Chapter 3, it says, In those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel, for they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. So it envisions the end time battle as being a literal battle between Israel, which is in the city, and then in the valleys around, below the city, the nations of the world are gathered. And so it views the end time as this battle between Israel and the nations. And then uh, in verses 9 to 13, uh, continuing that picture, it says, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations from every side, and assemble here. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. So it, it pictures the end time battle between God and his people and the enemy nations uh, that are surrounding there. And you may have recognized, you know, beat your plowshares into swords. Uh, uh, Isaiah says the opposite, you know. And so this is, a, this is an ironic uh, quotation, I think, perhaps, of Isaiah. Or the other way around. It uh, depends on which one wrote first, and I don't think we're sure. But then the call is, bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge the nations at every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Does it sound like chapter 14? For the wine press is full, and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. So this whole idea of a harvest, an enemy harvest that is there, uh, you see uh, in this text. And then in verses 16 and 17, the Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and sky will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade them. All right, so what does Revelation do with this text? And, and uh, what's similar, what's different? Well, you have a lot of the language that is similar, right? You have the judgment of the nations. Um, you have um, even, for example, in verse 3, you have this even reference to wine and prostitution. Well, uh, have given a boy as payment for a harlot and sold a girl for wine and they may, that they may drink. Even it reminds me, the wine of her fornication, Revelation. And you have... Um, the sickle, the harvest, the winepress, this language that we find in uh, Revelation 14. 
And then um, it's very interesting because in the previous episode, I pointed how you have in the Gospels this language also of the Son of Man. And there uh, you also find uh, these references that Jesus makes to the sun and the moon and signs in the sky. And in Joel uh, 3, verse 15, you also find that. Um, you have uh, verse 15, the sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. So there's a lot of connections. Uh, and then there's Zion, of course, verse 16, and then which is where the 144,000 are with the lamp in the beginning of Revelation 14. So there's a lot of connections um, there, not only with Revelation 14, but also with the texts in the gospel that also um, uh, converse with Revelation 14. Mm -hmm. So in chapter 14 of Revelation, there is a city and there are people outside the city, so that fits. Mm -hmm. But six times it says the earth will be harvested, not the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The earth will be harvested and uh, the, the grapes of the whole earth will be trampled underfoot. So what's going on? In, in Revelation 14. How is it can, using it? Can you read the other verses in Revelation 14? Uh, so sure. we can, uh, maybe we should do it one verse by verse, but maybe we could get the sort of sense of the whole mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, in the verse 15, maybe. And all. Okay, so starting with verse 15, it says, Another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle, there's Joel, and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So there's a difference. It's not the harvest of the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Uh, the sickle is there, but now it's the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle, gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle to the earth, gathered its grapes, threw them in the winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. So I was pointing out the contrast. The language here is the language of Jerusalem and the valley that surrounds, but six times it says earth. And, and also another contrast is that here you have two harvests. And in Joel, um, as far as I see, it only refers to the sickle harvesting the grapes, right? Uh, so even though you have the sickle here of the son of man, and then the harvesting of the earth, a good harvest, um, then in, in, in Joel, you, you only have a reference for the harvest of the grapes, um, of the grapes of wrath, if you put, put it that way. Um, yeah. yeah, I think those are very important. Uh, there are two harvests. There is a good harvest, the wheat harvest, and there is a bad harvest, the grapes. <clears throat> if I may, I could mm -hmm. help with the city and, and say which city it is. Okay, let's do this. Wh which city is it? That, yeah. that, you know, that wine press was trodden outside the city, but the city is not yet introduced to us because the, the best candidate city here is the New Jerusalem. So if I could read the verses that seem to me to be relevant mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, for us to locate the city. That would begin in Revelation 21 too. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. That's 21 too. So this is in mm -hmm. some ways, that's the, the city that we are reading about in Revelation 14:20 has in the narrative of Revelation not come down to earth yet. Mm -hmm. You know, that Revelation assumes something here that we only get to know or have confirmed later. And then Revelation 29, this is after the millennium, 
when there is a battle congregating around the city. So chapter 20, verse 9. Yeah. Yes, they, go ahead. They marched up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So here mm -hmm. is the city again. Mm -hmm. It came down from heaven in the end, but there mm -hmm. is a battle. There is something assumed earlier about that city. And then Revelation 19:15. This is the rider on the white horse. He will tread the winepress of the anger of the wrath of God the Almighty. That's 1915. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for, uh, 1420. Mm -hmm. And the winepress was trodden outside the city. And so I'm suggesting that the candidate city here is, yes. is the New Jerusalem and the battle that is described in some what in chapter 19, more in chapter 20. That's the battle we are witnessing. And then uh, the bloodshed outside the city, that gruesome scene, that strange language that Revelation uses here. And I calculated it, the blood at, up as high as the bridles of the horses, that's about five feet at least, maybe six feet. So that much blood uh, all the way from here in Loma Linda to the Mexican border, <laughs> you know, the world is drowning in blood. Mm -hmm. And this is a wonderful metaphor, not for the divine judgment on humans, but for the way evil implodes. That sort of bloodbath, the world drowning in blood, is in some ways, as we may see, more clearly when we converse uh, later in our conversation, how evil comes to an end outside the city, as it will in Revelation 20 when we we'll get there. But just to uh, my my uh, the, the, my goal of this long comment is really to say the city that is described here in Revelation 14:20 is the New Jerusalem, and, and he doesn't have oh, to say that here because the whole passage is referring to Joel. And in Joel, it's very clear very that this yeah. language is about the city, very you good. see. So yeah. he doesn't have to say it in chapter 14. It will come later, but uh, the, the astute reader who knows Joel 3 will see where he's heading. Yes. Yeah. Now, an interesting thing also is when you consider Jewish expectations for the lastingness of earthly Jerusalem, Right, you have uh, these expectations in the Old Testament in, in, in general, in, uh, in Judaism in, in general, in Jewish thought in general, that Jerusalem would last. But there's also conditionality to that, conditioned upon being faithful to the God of the covenant who would then protect that city. In the, in, in the New Testament, in Hebrews 13, you also find a reference to outside the city. Uh, and it addresses also the notion of a city that lasts, it says very interestingly in, um, in verse, uh, verses 12 to 14, Hebrews 13, verses 12 to 14. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. This is also to reflect uh, the uh, sanctuary system and how it worked. But then in verse 13, it calls, therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, or we have no permanent city, but we seek the one to come. So there is a recognition, even in the first century, in the New Testament, that we don't look forward to the everlasting prosperity of earthly Jerusalem, but it is the city that is to come. Right, the hopes are directed to that city. And now this, the thing here with outside the city has a twist. We're invited to go outside the city and meet Jesus, but that's a place also of reproach. But those who accept the reproach of being associated with Jesus are those that at the end will be inside that heavenly city. Those who reject that reproach and give in to the beastly coercion. You either accept the mark of the beast on your forehead or on your hand. Those who maybe give in, even though maybe they don't agree, but they give in because they don't want to participate of the reproach of living a 
according to what God asks them to live in actual way that reflects really the commandments of Jesus and the faith of, uh, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, they will be found outside the city. There is a reversal. Those who are willing now to be outside in the place of reproach will be inside. And those who are unwilling and would rather compromise and engage in the beastly systems, they will be outside rather than inside. There is a reversal there. Fascinating parallel there with Hebrews. So uh, the sense of reversal, I think, is very strong. And for people who are suffering, who are persecuted, it's a powerful message of hope, you know, that, uh, that the situation you're in, God is able to reverse. Let me point out something else, because the question is, you know, in Joel, you have a literal city and a literal people surrounded by literal nations in a local setting. So what's happening here? This is clearly worldwide. How is it stretching all of that? And to me, a fascinating text that I've, I've rarely heard anybody notice is Acts chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 4, uh, you have a prayer. And in the prayer, something very startling occurs. Uh, Acts 4 and verse 25. So the, uh, yeah, we'll go back to verse 24. The apostles are under persecution. Peter and John have been put in prison and then finally got released and they're, they're saying, they're talking to God about this uh, experience. And they say, Sovereign Lord, you made heaven, earth, the sea, and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit for the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. All right, so they're quoting Old Testament, mm -hmm. the picture we see in Joel. This is actually Psalm 2, a different text, but it's the same picture that the Old Testament picture at the end of time, literal Jerusalem would be surrounded by literal nations seeking to destroy uh, God's uh, people. And so they are applying that to their situation. Mm -hmm. And notice what they do. Indeed, verse 27, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. And so you see here, the apostles are taking Joel, reading it, and who is the one being surrounded? It is the apostles mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the nascent church that is there. Who are the nations? Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. So in the Old Testament, the faithfulness was between Israel and the nations, but now it is those who follow Jesus and those who oppose Jesus are in the place of the nations. And I think that's when you're reading Revelation to keep in mind, some people read Revelation as if that literal Middle Eastern story will get replayed at the end. But in actual fact, Revelation expands things worldwide and defines Israel as those who have a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You have, for example, in the message to the Church of Smyrna, the reference to uh, the blasphemy or the slander they were suffering from those who say they are Jews, but uh, they are not. They are synagogue of Satan. There is this contrast, right, throughout Revelation between the truth and the lie, uh, reality and appearance. And then you have this apocalyptic paradigm to discern things, knowing that there is more beyond what the eye can see, that what might seem a very um, godly thing, right, as, as I think... Uh, Two episodes ago, you brought up what might seem as a very godly thing might be opposing God, in fact. So sometimes the tables are turned in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. 
So the, the apostles are living in a situation where roles were reversed. And uh, it's helpful to keep that in mind. That does not mean that uh, you know, we should take up war against the Jews or something like that. The as, apostles as were some Jews may themselves. have read this in the past. <laughs> Right. It is simply a recognition God did a mighty thing here. Mm -hmm. And some, who used to be called people of God, opposed that with violence mm -hmm. and uh, to seek to stop it. And so it caused them to reread how the end time passages would occur. Well, the, <clears throat> the remaining question, once we have located the good and the bad, you know, and these reversals, the question is, uh, when all this, this treading of the winepress, is God bringing the wicked, as it were, is he bringing the wicked to an end by killing them, by violence? Is the carnage that we are witnessing here described as the treading of the winepress and that all this blood that flows, is that God inflicting that kind of carnage on the wicked, or is something else at work that there that, is? That? That's a really important point. Why don't you walk us through some of the evidence that has caused you to, to see that differently than many do? Well, so there are two or three, three uh, elements here. The, the, one, uh, the, uh, the first one is that the battle that happens outside of the city in Revelation 20 is described in language from Ezekiel. Gog and Magog, and I will right. bring up, you know, so Satan is there and he's mobilizing this army and they are moving toward the city confident of victory. This is going to, this time they will win it, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're striding toward mm -hmm. the city. And in the Gog and Magog passages in Ezekiel, every, suddenly the army kind of falls apart and they start fighting among themselves. Every man's sword will be against his brother. That is Ezekiel 20, 38, 21. So they are fighting among themselves. And that, to me, is a crucial detail to say that this army discovers at some point, in the blaze of revelation, it discovers that this was futile. They, in some ways, discover that they were tricked that they have been had by their leader. And then they start fighting among themselves. And this carnage that is described is the, car the sort of carnage that shows how evil comes to grief and fall at the, falls at its own hand. There is a passage in the book of Enoch, that's the second piece of evidence, that, you know, to what extent does Revelation use non-canonical sources Mm -hmm. It doesn't do it very often. Not often. Hardly at mm -hmm. all. But it probably does it here, because from the, in First Enoch there is a passage that seems quite similar to what we are seeing, seeing uh, in Revelation 14.20. Here I'm reading from First Enoch, uh, chapter 100, verses 1 to 3. In those days the father will be beaten together with his son, sons in one place, and brothers shall fall together with their friends in death until a stream shall flow with their blood. For a man shall not be able to withhold his hands from his sons, nor from his sons' sons in order to kill them. He kills his children and his grandchildren, mm -hmm. as it were. Nor is it possible for the sinner to withhold his hand from his honor, honored brother. From dawn until the sun sets, they shall slay each other. The horse shall walk through the blood of sinners up to his chest, and the chariot shall sink down up to its top. That is very similar to Revelation 14, 20. Mm -hmm. And it shows an army or it shows a, a force where they start fighting among themselves and where the dearest human relations have ceased to function. You kill your next of kin. You are... There is nothing left here, and the glue that bound us together is gone. And this army that comes to grief, then outside the city, is an army that comes to grief from its own intrinsic 
unsustainability. It, it mm. just wasn't working. And this is happening. Nobody leaves the city, not even Jesus. Mm. You know, so when he treads the wine press, we have to look at it in, in, uh, in a bigger picture. There is one last uh, text that sheds light on this, and that is Isaiah 63. But I have talked too much now, so now I need to, <laughs> yeah. to, to uh, give it over to you again. Well, speaking from a Seventh-day Adventist perspective, it seems to me in all of human literature, probably the clearest description of these events in Revelation 20 is in a book called Great Controversy by Ellen White. And I'm, it, it recalled to my mind that, that she would see Satan and his army approaching the New Jerusalem and uh, when they see Jesus, when they see the beauties of the city, when they realize, you know, they, they get a full understanding of what God has done through all of this and how they have responded, that they become furious with Satan. Mm -hmm. And they turn on him and then they begin to fight each other. So that the picture you're describing uh, is, I think, uh, <coughs> described also yeah. in that book for what it is worth. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the question might be, how do we know that New Testament writers would have had Enoch in mind at this point? And I think the answer to that is the book of Jude does quote Enoch. So uh, you, you have one place in the New Testament, at least, where there's a clear quotation, the actual words taken out and, and, and given. That was a tradition that was known to the early Christians. So the idea of uh, bringing Enoch in, I think, is not a totally foreign thing uh, from their way of thinking. Or it could be a shared perspective yeah. that they have, you know, that these texts had the same vision of how the other side, how the bad side will come to grief. The Isaiah text, if I may just say one thing about it, Jesus is, uh, <clears throat> there is this, uh, who is he? He who comes from Edom with red, you know, garments mm -hmm. from Buzra, you know, his, why are your garments red and, and, and so on? And he says that I, I uh, defeated my enemies and their blood splattered on my, on my garments. And then he says, I looked around to see if there was anyone to help me. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't anyone. I had to do it alone. I had to do it all alone. It is the aloneness of the divine, divine warrior that is the striking thing. And since you mentioned Ellen G. White, and since we are in the habit of mentioning her sparingly here, let's mention her one more time, mm -hmm. though. We have about 45 seconds in, carried in through. Gethsemane, in Jesus' Gethsemane struggle, as she describes it in the book, The, Great, uh, the Sorrow of Ages, she says, he had trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was no one to help him. So there is Jesus treading the wine press in that sense in, in uh, the Gethsemane story. Gethsemane, yeah. All alone. Yeah, very powerful. Well, we call this program God's <laughs> Prophetic Surprises, because when you get deep into the book of Revelation, you never know what you're going to get. And sometimes it's a very glorious surprise. Thank you, Sigva, for being with us today. And thank you for joining us in GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises. See you again next time.